This video was made possible thanks to CuriosityStream. Watch TLDR ad-free and get exclusive access to videos from us by signing up to the CuriosityStream Nebula bundle deal at curiositystream.com forward slash TLDR EU. On the 21st of February, the Russian Federation formally announced its full diplomatic recognition of two secessionist republics in Donbass, the Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic pre-staging the ongoing invasion in Ukraine. However, this is not the first, the second, or even the third time that Russia has recognised breakaway states in Eastern Europe. In fact, it's been happening ever since the Soviet Union collapsed. Prior to the Donbass breakaway states, there have been three other republics which Russia has directly supported, Transnistria, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia. So in this video, we're going to be looking at each of those three republics and how they got into their own respective constitutional quagmires. Let's start with the oldest breakaway state on the list, the Pridnestovian Moldovan Republic. Better known as Transnistria, it's a narrow sliver of land sandwiched between Moldova and Ukraine. The story of Transnistria starts in 1924, with the founding of the Moldovian Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic, or MASSR, which then existed within the Ukrainian Soviet Republic, which itself was a republic within the Soviet Union. This new political entity was intended to be the national home for the Moldovans who lived along the border with then-Romanian-controlled Bessarabia. The MASSR, which was already majority ethnically Ukrainian, ended up becoming thoroughly Sovietized. After the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in 1937, the Soviet Union demanded Bessarabia in an ultimatum to Romania, and in its place established the new Moldovan Soviet Socialist Republic, which included Transnistria. Things quickly fell apart with the collapse of the Soviet Union, though, when national pro-democratic movements sprang up around the Soviet republics, including Moldova. The mayor of Tarazopol at the time, and an ardent supporter of the USSR, was worried about a possible union between Moldova and Romania, so coordinated a wave of strikes in Transnistria to pressure the rest of Moldova to stop its drift towards independence. When this failed in 1990, Mayor Smirnov declared the Pridnestrovian Moldovan Soviet Socialist Republic in the area now known as Transnistria, with the goal of becoming a constituent Soviet Republic of the USSR. Unfortunately, this didn't go well for him, though. Gorbachev didn't recognise the Republic, and a war ensued between Transnistria and the now-independent Republic of Moldova, which claimed Transnistria within its territory. The war claimed nearly a thousand lives. Moldova eventually agreed to negotiations with Boris Yeltsin, where they agreed to form a new joint control commission. The area was ultimately demilitarized, with Russia, Moldova, and Transnistria providing peacekeepers for the region. Ironically, the country never fulfilled its dream of becoming a legitimate Soviet republic, as the USSR collapsed half a year prior to the end of the war. Today, Transnistria represents a last remnant of a bygone era. It maintains its Soviet flag and coat of arms, and even calls its parliament the Supreme Soviet. It also has a rapidly declining population of about 350,000 inhabitants, down from about half a million 10 years ago. According to the 2015 census, 29.1% of the country is Russian, 28.6% is Moldovan, while 22.9% is Ukrainian, and over 90% are Orthodox Christians. Despite the lack of international recognition, the country is quite well accessible, and if you've got a passport and proper paperwork, travel between Moldova and Transnistria is unrestricted. Russia still maintains a hefty military presence in the region, and Transnistria has aligned many of its laws with Russia. All three of its presidents have also supported accession to the Russian Federation. Promise of future accession to Russia was even approved in the 2006 referendum on independence, but Russia is yet to recognize or annex the region, instead mostly using Transnistria as a means to influence Moldovan internal affairs. Nonetheless, we can't know for certain that Russia won't reevaluate its strategy, especially given Putin's recent behavior in Ukraine and Moldova's recent application to join the EU. 
Before we move on to address the duo of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, if you want to know even more about Transnistria, then we made an entire video on its history and its current status, which is exclusively on Nebula. And we'll explain how you can watch that at the end of this video. Anyway, like Transnistria, the story of these two republics begins with the Soviet Union. Abkhazia had been part of the autonomous Soviet Republic under Georgia since 1931, while South Ossetia was an autonomous oblast. Unlike Transnistria, both countries represent their own unique ethnic group. The Abkhazians are a unique ethnic group from the North Caucasus, with their closest related group being the Circassians in Russia. They mostly inhabit Abkhazia, although they can also be found in Russia, Turkey and Syria. The Ossetians are a much larger ethnic group, where most of their population lives in North Ossetia Alania, a constituent republic of Russia, right on the other side of the mountains from South Ossetia. Curiously, they are of Iranic people, meaning that they belong to the same ethno-linguistic group as the Kurds, Persians and Pashtuns. Abkhazia is estimated to have a population of under a quarter of a million people, while South Ossetia sits at about 50,000. Both countries are majority Eastern Orthodox, with Abkhazia having a significant Muslim minority. Similar to Transnistria, the Abkhazians and Ossetians petitioned the Soviet Union to be directly integrated as new Soviet republics in order to escape Georgia's increasingly nationalistic and pro-independence drift. Georgian nationalists disagreed though, and their president at the time demanded that the two countries were stripped of any autonomy completely. In response, the two boycotted the 1991 Georgian independence referendum, and tensions finally peaked in 1992 when Abkhaz separatist militants took over their capital and proclaimed independence. This was after Georgia had already fought a war with the Ossetians, which resulted in approximately a thousand fatalities, and was only ended by a Russian brokered ceasefire. The year-long war in Abkhazia, though, would be even bloodier. In the middle of political unrest in Georgia proper, the Abkhazian conflict saw brutal war crimes and acts of ethnic cleansing on both sides. The worst recorded incidents of this was the massacre in Sukhumi, which saw over a thousand civilians brutally murdered. The overall toll of the war is estimated to be between 25 and 30,000 people, and in the end, Georgia was again defeated with the new ceasefire setting a de facto independent Abkhazia. This was mainly thanks to support from Chechen and Cossack fighters, as well as alleged Russian contribution. This fragile peace in Georgia was shaken just 10 years later though, when the regime of Edward Sevvajani in Georgia got ousted after the events of the Rose Revolution. This saw the rise of a new pro-Western president, and as a result, their relationship with Russia deteriorated even further. After a sudden escalation of conflict with South Ossetia, which broke the 1992 ceasefire, Russian alleged that Georgia was at fault, and responded with its own peace enforcement operation in 2008. Despite the conflict only originally being about the Ossetians, Russia advanced deep into Georgian territory, and aided Abkhazia in conquering all of its claimed territory. As a result, 20,000 Georgians were forcibly displaced from Ossetia, and the two breakaway republics finally secured their claimed territories. As is the case with Transnistria, are essentially acting as Russian satellites, relying on Russia for both economic and military guarantees. Both regions have also flirted with the idea of integrating into Russia proper, and unlike Transnistria, they do receive formal recognition of statehood from Russia and Russian allies like Venezuela and Syria. The big question now though for all three of these Russian-backed separatist regions is whether Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a symptom of a new, more expansionist foreign policy from Putin, and whether this will mean a session into the Russian Federation anytime in the near future. Like I said though, we have an exclusive video all about Transnistria on Nebula right now. You might have heard of it before, but my creator friends and I teamed up to build our own platform where we don't need to worry about demonetization or the algorithm. Over there, you can find all of our latest videos ad-free, and we're also starting to post exclusive Nebula Plus videos over there as well. It's not just us either. 
All of our favourite educational creators are there too, like Wendover Productions, Real Life Law, Polymatter, Legal Legal, Half as Interesting, and many more. But wait, we said this video was brought to you by CuriosityStream, right? Well, as a platform full of the best documentaries available online, they naturally love educational creators like us. And as such, we've worked out a deal whereby if you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description, you'll also get access to Nebula for free. That's not a trial either, you'll have access for as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. To make things even better, for a limited time they're offering a deal where you can get 26% off their already low price, making an entire year of both services less than $15. $15 for all of your favourite educational creators, as well as superb documentaries on CuriosityStream. Signing up at curiositystream.com forward slash TLDREU or clicking the link below not only gets you the deal, but it also directly supports TLDR and other educational content creators on the platform, as well as getting your original content and an ad-free experience.